Chapter twenty four of Good Stories for Great Birthdays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Olcott. September sixth, the Marquis de Lafayette, the Friend of America as soon as i heard of american independence my heart was enlisted lafayette lafayette said when offering his services to congress after the sacrifices i have made i have the right to exact two favors one is to serve at my own expense the other is to serve at first as volunteer john quincy adams to lafayette on bidding him farewell in eighteen twenty five our children in life and after death shall claim you for our own you are ours by that more than patriotic devotion with which you flew to the aid of our fathers at the crisis of their fate ours by that tie of love stronger than death which has linked your name for endless ages to come with the name of washington lafayette was born in france september sixth seventeen fifty seven he came to the rescue of america seventeen seventy seven he made his triumphal tour eighteen twenty four to eighteen twenty five he died in france may twentieth eighteen thirty four his full name was marie joseph paul eve roche gilbert de motier marquis de lafayette he preferred to be called plain citizen gilbert motier i will join the americans one night in seventeen seventy six the old marshal commander of the french forces at strasbourg was giving a dinner party in honor of the duke of gloucester this light-hearted english duke was in disgrace with his royal brother king george the third of england so he was taking a little trip abroad at the marshal's dinner he was maliciously regaling the guests with a humorous account of how the americans had flouted king george and had flung his chests of tea into boston harbor and had declared their independence the duke's sympathies were all with the americans and he dwelt on their need of volunteers amongst the guests officers in blue and silver strasbourg grandees in gold lace and velvet all exclaiming laughing and gesticulating was one silent solemn-faced young officer he was lean red-haired and hook-nosed and very awkward he kept his eager eyes fixed on the duke's face nobody noticed him after dinner he strode across the room to the duke and opened his lips for the first time i will join the americans i will help them fight for freedom he cried and as he spoke his face was illuminated tell me how to set about it the young man was the marquis de lafayette nineteen years old a rich french noble the adoring husband of a sweet young wife and the father of one little child edith seichel retold in america accompanied by baron de kalb lafayette safely reached america and presented his credentials to congress washington met him first at a dinner in philadelphia he was so pleased with lafayette's eager brave spirit and with his unselfish offer of sword and fortune for the american cause that he invited him to become a member of his family and to make headquarters his home lafayette was delighted and immediately had his luggage taken to the camp and from that time on he was always a welcome guest both at camp and at mount vernon on the field near camden what became of lafayette's companion the baron de kalb he served his adopted country the united states until at the battle near camden he fell still fighting though pierced by eleven wounds the rebel general the rebel general shouted the british soldiers who saw him fall and they rushed forward to transfix him with their bayonets but his faithful adjutant tried to throw himself on the baron's body to shield it crying out at the same time spare the baron de kalb the rough soldiers raised the wounded baron to his feet and leaning him against a wagon began to strip him just then the british general lord cornwallis rode up he saw his valiant enemy stripped to his shirt the blood pouring from his eleven wounds 
immediately he gave orders that the baron should be treated with respect and care i regret to see you so badly wounded he said but am glad to have defeated you the baron was carried to a bed he was given every care his devoted adjutant watched by his bedside and the british officers came to express their sympathy and regret but the brave baron lingered three days only then he died almost his last thoughts were with the men of his command he charged his adjutant to thank them for their valor and to bid them an affectionate farewell from him the people of camden erected a monument in memory of the baron de kalb the banner of the moravian nuns take thy banner and beneath the war clouds encircling wreath guard it till our homes are free guard it god will prosper thee take thy banner and if e'er thou shouldst press the soldier's bier and the muffled drum should beat to the tread of mournful feet then this crimson flag shall be martial cloak and shroud for thee and the warrior took that banner proud and it was his martial cloak and shroud from the hymn of the moravian nuns henry wadsworth longfellow it was the young and gallant marquis de lafayette who during the terrible rout on the field of brandywine leaped from his horse and sword in hand tried to rally the fleeing american soldiers but a musket ball passing through his leg he fell wounded to the ground his brave aide-de-camp placed lafayette on his own horse thus saving his life lafayette then tried to rejoin washington but his wound bled so badly that he had to stop and have his leg bandaged meanwhile it was growing dark all was fear and confusion around him the american soldiers were fleeing from every direction toward the village of chester they were rushing on in headlong flight with cannon and baggage wagons the thunder of the enemy's guns the clouds of dust the shouts and cries the general panic were terrific lafayette was forced to retreat with the army but in spite of his wound he retained presence of mind enough to station a guard at the bridge before chester with commands to keep all retreating soldiers from crossing it so when washington and general green rode up they were able to rally the soldiers and restore something like order as for lafayette he was soon after carried to the town of bethlehem in pennsylvania and left with the moravian nuns these good women nursed him and bestowed every kindly care upon him until his wound was healed and he was able to rejoin the army he had been serving without a command but after his gallant action at brandywine he was made head of a division it was while lafayette was still at bethlehem that a brilliant officer from the american army came to see him he was the lithuanian polish patriot count kazimir pulaski all the nuns and in fact everyone in bethlehem knew count pulaski's romantic history how while in poland he had fought for the independence of his country and had been sent into exile he was now fighting for america's liberty and when the nuns learned that count pulaski was raising a corps in baltimore they were eager to honor him with their own hands they made a banner of crimson silk embroidering it beautifully this they sent to him with their blessing he carried the crimson banner through battle and danger until at last he fell so badly wounded that he died the crimson banner was rescued and carried back to baltimore loyal to the chief it was during that terrible winter at valley forge that generals gates and conway with malice and duplicity were plotting against washington they wanted to win the young and influential marquis de lafayette to their conspiracy they planned to do so by separating him from washington so they used their influence to have him appointed to an independent command with conway as his chief lieutenant and this they did without consulting washington but they reckoned without their host the gallant young frenchman was loyal he was incapable of a dastardly act though scarcely twenty years old he had a mind of his own he refused to take command without washington's consent and insisted on having baron de kalb not conway for his lieutenant then he set out for york to get his papers he had left washington with the soldiers starving and shivering at valley forge he found general gates and his officers in york comfortably seated at dinner the table laden with food and drink 
they were flushed and noisy with wine and greeted lafayette with shouts of welcome they fawned upon him they complimented and toasted him he listened to them quietly and as soon as he received his papers rose as if to make a speech there was a breathless silence all eyes were fixed upon him in politest tones he reminded them that there was one toast that they had forgotten and which he now proposed the health of the commander-in-chief of the armies of the united states there was silence there was consternation and embarrassment no one dared refuse to drink some merely touched the glasses to their lips others set them down scarcely tasted then bowing with mock politeness and shrugging his shoulders lafayette left the dining hall and mounting his horse rode away john fisk and other sources retold we are grateful lafayette during the war for independence lafayette served without pay he also cheerfully expended one hundred and forty thousand dollars out of his own fortune purchasing a ship to bring him to america and raising equipping arming and clothing a regiment and when he landed in america he brought with him munitions of war which he presented to our army he gave shoes clothes and food to our naked suffering american soldiers after the war was over some small recognition was offered him by our government but while on his visit here in eighteen twenty five to show appreciation of his unselfish aid to us in time of need and in compensation for his expenditures congress passed a bill presenting him with two hundred thousand dollars and a grant of land there were however a few members of congress who violently opposed the bill much to the shame of all grateful citizens and one member of congress humiliated at this opposition tried to apologize delicately to lafayette i sir am one of the opposition exclaimed lafayette the gift is so munificent so far exceeding the services of the individual that had i been a member of congress i must have voted against it and to congress itself lafayette deeply touched said the immense and unexpected gift which in addition to former and considerable bounties it has pleased congress to confer upon me calls for the warmest acknowledgments of an old american soldier an adopted son of the united states two titles dearer to my heart than all the treasures in the world some of washington's hair cordial ties bound the land of washington to the land of bolivar one hundred years ago then the south american liberator was held in such high esteem here that after the death of washington his family sent bolivar several relics of the national hero of the united states including locks of washington's hair the gift was transmitted through lafayette who had it presented to bolivar by a french officer and the latter bore back to the noble french comrade of washington an eloquent letter of thanks from bolivar the south american liberator professed throughout his life ardent admiration for the united states and once in conversation with an american officer in peru prophesied that within one hundred years the land of washington would stand first in the world t r ibarra welcome friend of america eighteen twenty four to eighteen twenty five it was twenty five years after the death of washington it was eighteen twenty four in new york city joy bells were ringing bands playing cannon saluting flags waving and two hundred thousand people wildly cheering the marquise de lafayette was visiting america he was landing at the battery he was no longer the slender debonair young french officer who afire with ardent courage had served under washington but a man of sixty-seven large massive almost six feet tall his rugged face expressing a strong noble character his fine hazel eyes beaming with pleasure and affection but his manner was the same courtly gracious one of the young man of nineteen who so long ago had exclaimed i will join the americans i will help them fight for freedom since the american war for independence lafayette had been through the terrible french revolution and had spent five years in an austrian prison now as he landed once more on american soil he was the honored and idolized guest of millions of grateful citizens of the united states as he stepped from a gaily decorated boat 
and stood among the throngs of cheering new york folk his eyes filled with tears he had expected only a little welcome instead he found the whole nation waiting expectant and eager to do him honor his tour of the country in a barouche drawn by four white horses was one continuous procession enormous crowds gathered everywhere to greet him as he went from city to city town to town and village to village he passed beneath arches of flowers and arbors of evergreens children and young girls welcomed him with songs and officials with addresses he was banqueted and feted lafayette lafayette was the roar that went up from millions of throats at fort mchenry he was conducted into the tent that had been washington's during the war for independence there some of lafayette's old comrades in arms veteran members of the society of the cincinnati were awaiting him lafayette embraced them with tears of joy then looking around the tent and seeing some of washington's equipment he exclaimed in a subdued voice i remember i remember later in the day a procession was formed which as it passed through the streets of baltimore displayed in a place of honor the crimson silk banner of count pulaski embroidered for him by the moravian nuns of bethlehem pennsylvania in boston lafayette in a barouche drawn by four beautiful white horses was escorted by a brilliant procession through the streets at the common he passed between two lines of school children girls in white and boys in blue and white and a lovely little girl crowned him with a wreath of blossoms across washington street were thrown two arches decorated with flags and inscribed with the words welcome lafayette the fathers in glory shall sleep that gathered with thee to the fight but the sons will eternally keep the tablet of gratitude bright we bow not the neck and we bend not the knee but our hearts lafayette we surrender to thee and when he entered lexington he passed beneath an arch on which was written in flowers welcome friend of america to the birthplace of american liberty End of section 24、Chapter、25 By Bo Wood, Good Stories for Great Birthdays, by Francis Jenkins Alcott, September twenty-four, John Marshall, the Expounder of the Constitution. I had grown up at a time when the maxim "United we stand, divided we fall" was the maxim of every orthodox American. And I had imbibed these sentiments so thoroughly that they constituted a part of my being. John Marshall. He had a deep sense of moral and religious obligation, and a love of truth, constant, enduring, unflinching. It naturally gave rise to a sincerity of thought, purpose, expression. And conduct, which though never severe, was always open, manly, and straightforward. Yet it was combined with such a gentle and bland demeanor that it never gave offense, but it was, on the contrary, most persuasive in its appeals to the understanding. Justice Joseph Story. John Marshall was born in Virginia, September twenty-four, seventeen fifty-five. Became an officer in a company of Minutemen, seventeen seventy-five. Was envoy to France, seventeen ninety-seven. Was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, eighteen o one. He died July six. Eighteen thirty-five. The boy of the frontier, in a log cabin, through the ancient and unbroken forest, 
toward the Monongahela River, Braddock made his slow and painful way. Weeks passed, then months, but the colonist felt no impatience because everybody knew what would happen when his scarlet columns should finally meet and throw themselves upon the enemy. Yet this meeting, when it came, proved to be one of the lesser tragedies of history and had a deep and fateful effect upon American public opinion and upon the life and future of the American people. Time has not dulled the vivid picture of that disaster. The golden sunshine of that July day, the pleasant murmur of the waters of the Monongahela, the silent and somber forest, the steady tramp, tramp of the British to the inspiriting music of their regimental bands, playing the martial airs of England. The bright uniforms of the advancing columns, giving to the background of stream and forest a touch of splendor. And then, the ambush and surprise, the war hoops of savage foes that could not be seen, the hail of invisible death, no pellet of which went astray, the pathetic volleys which the doomed British troops fired at hidden antagonists, the panic, the rout, the pursuit, the slaughter, the crushing, humiliating defeat. Most of the British officers were killed or wounded as they vainly tried to halt the stampede. Braddock himself received a mortal hurt. Furious at what he felt was the stupidity and cowardice of the British regulars, the youthful Washington rode among the fear-frenzied Englishmen striving to save the day. Two horses were shot under him. Four bullets rent his uniform. But crazed with fright, the royal soldiers were beyond human control. Only the Virginia Rangers kept their heads and their courage. Obeying the shouted orders of their young commander, they threw themselves between the terror-stricken British and the savage victors, and, fighting behind trees and rocks, were an ever-moving rampart of fire that saved the flying remnants of the English troops. But for Washington and his rangers, Braddock's whole force would have been annihilated. So everywhere went up the cry, the British are beaten. At first, rumor had it that the whole force was destroyed and that Washington had been killed in action. But soon another word followed, hard upon this error, the word that the boyish Virginia captain and his rangers had fought with coolness, skill, and courage that they alone had prevented the extinction of the British regulars. Thus it was that the American colonists suddenly came to think that they themselves must be their own defenders. It was a revelation, all the more impressive because it was so abrupt, unexpected, and dramatic, that the red-coated professional soldiers were not the unconquerable warriors the colonists had been told they were. From colonial mansion to log cabin, from the provincial capitals to the mean and exposed frontier settlements, Braddock's defeat sowed the seed of the idea that Americans must depend upon themselves. Close upon the heels of this epic-making event, John Marshall came into the world. He was born in a little log cabin in what is now a part of Virginia, 11 weeks after Braddock's defeat. The Marshall cabin stood about a mile and a half from a cluster of a dozen similar log structures, a little settlement practically on the frontier. Off to the Blue Ridge. Some 10 years after Braddock's defeat, we can picture 
a strong, rude wagon, drawn by two horses, crawling along the stumpy, rock-roughened, and mud-mired road through the dense woods that led to a valley in the Blue Ridge Mountains. In the wagon sat a young woman. By her side, a sturdy, red-cheeked boy looked out with alert but quiet interest, showing from his brilliant black eyes. And three other children cried their delight or vexation as the hours wore on. The red-cheeked boy was John Marshall. In this wagon, too, were piled the little family's household goods. By the side of the wagon strode a young man dressed in the costume of the frontier. Tall, broad shoulder, lithe hipped, erect, he was a very oak of a man. His splendid head was carried with a peculiar dignity, and the grave but kindly command that shone from his face together with the brooding thoughtfulness and fearless light of his striking eyes would have singled him out in any assemblage as a man to be respected and trusted. A Negro drove the team, and a Negro girl walked behind. So went little John Marshall with his father and mother from the log cabin to their new Blue Ridge home which was not a log cabin, but a frame house built of whipsawed uprights and boards. Making an American John Marshall lived near the frontier until he was 19, when, as lieutenant of the famous Culpeper Minutemen, he marched away to battle. And during those 19 years, he had been growing up to be an American. The earliest stories told little John Marshall must have been frontier ones of daring and sacrifice. Almost from the homemade cradle, he was taught the idea of American solidarity. Braddock's defeat was the theme of fireside talk of the colonist, and from this grew in time the conviction that Americans if united, could not only protect their homes from the savages and the French, but could defeat, if need be, the British themselves. So thought John Marshall's father and mother, and so they taught their children. For the most part, the boys' days were spent studying and reading, or rifle in hand, in the surrounding mountains and by the pleasant waters that flowed through the valley of his forest home. He helped his mother, of course, did the innumerable chores which the day's work required, and looked after the younger children. He ate game from the forest and fish from the stream. Bear meat was plentiful. Whether at home with his mother or on surveying trips with his father, the boy continually was under the influence and direction of hardy, clear-minded, unusual parents. Their lofty and simple ideals, their rational thinking, their unbending uprightness, their religious convictions, these were the intellectual companions of John Marshall's childhood and youth. Give me liberty. Thomas Marshall, John's father, served in the Virginia House of Burgesses, of which Patrick Henry was a member. When Thomas Marshall returned to his Blue Ridge home, he described, of course, the scenes he had witnessed and taken part in. The heart of his son thrilled, we may be sure, as he listened to his father reciting Patrick Henry's words of fire. And again, when Patrick Henry became the voice of America and offered the resolutions for arming and defense 
and carried them with that amazing speech ending with, Give me liberty or give me death. Thomas Marshall sat beneath its spell. And John Marshall, now 19 years old, heard those words from his father's lips as the family clustered around the fireside of Oak Hill, their Blue Ridge home. The effect on John Marshall's mind and spirit was heroic and profound. Albert J. Beveridge arranged. The Young Lieutenant When John Marshall was 19, he was about six feet high, straight and rather slender, and of dark complexion. His eyes were dark to blackness, strong and penetrating, beaming with intelligence and good nature. His raven black hair was of unusual thickness. He was lieutenant of a company and wore a purple or pale blue hunting shirt and trousers of the same material fringed with white. A round black hat with a bucktail for a cockade crowned his figure. The news of the Battle of Lexington reached him, and he was soon on the muster field training his company. First, he made his men a speech, telling them that he had come to meet them as fellow soldiers who were likely to be called on to defend their country and their own rights and liberties, that there had been a battle at Lexington in which the Americans were victorious, but that more fighting was expected, that soldiers were called for, and that it was time to brighten their firearms and learn to use them in the field, and that if they would fall into a single line, he would show them the new manual exercise for which purpose he had brought his own gun. Then, before he required the men to imitate him, he went through the manual exercise by word and motion, deliberately pronounced and performed. He then proceeded to exercise them with the most perfect temper. Never did man possess a temper more happy or one more subdued or better disciplined. After a few lessons, he dismissed the company, saying that if they wished to hear more about the war, he would tell them what he understood about it. The men formed a circle about him, and he talked to them for about an hour. After that, he challenged an acquaintance to a game of quoits, and they closed the day with foot races and other athletic exercises. Horace Benny retold. Serving the Cause Young John Marshall became a lieutenant in the 1st Regiment of Minutemen raised in Virginia. These were the citizen soldiery of the colonies who were raised in a minute, armed in a minute, marched in a minute, fought in a minute, and vanquished in a minute. His father, Thomas Marshall, was major of this Virginia regiment of Minutemen. Their appearance was calculated to strike terror into the hearts of an enemy. They were dressed in green hunting shirts, homespun, homewoven, and homemade, with the words, Liberty or Death, in large white letters on their bosoms. They wore in their hats, bucktails, and in their belts, tomahawks, and scalping knives. Their savage, warlike appearance excited the terror of the inhabitants as they marched through the country. Lord Dunmore told his troops before the action at the Great Bridge that if they fell into the hands of the shirt men, they would be scalped. To the honor of the shirt men, it should be observed that they treated the British prisoners with great kindness, a kindness which was felt and gratefully acknowledged. Henry Flanders Arranged At Valley Forge, through the battles of Iron Hill, 
of Brandywine, of Germantown, and of Monmouth, John Marshall bore himself bravely, and through the dreary privations, the hunger, and the nakedness of that ghastly winter at Valley Forge, his patient endurance and his cheeriness bespoke the very sweetest temper that ever man was blessed with. So long as any lived to speak, men would tell how he was loved by the soldiers and by his brother officers, how he was the arbiter of their differences and the composer of their disputes. And when called to act, as he often was, as judge advocate, he exercised that peculiar and delicate judgment required of him, who is not only the prosecutor, but the protector of the accused. It was in the duties of this office that he first met and came to know well the two men whom, of all others on earth, he most admired and loved, and whose impress he bore through his life, Washington and Hamilton. William Henry Rawl arranged. Silver Heels Young John Marshall surpassed in athletics any man in the army. When the soldiers were idle at their quarters, it was usual for the officers to engage in a game of quoits or in jumping and racing. Then he would throw a quoit farther and beat at a race any other. He was the only man who, with a running jump, could clear a stick laid on the heads of two men as tall as himself. On one occasion, he ran a race in his stocking feet with a comrade. His mother, in knitting his stockings, had knit the legs of blue yarn and the heels of white. Because of this, and because he always won the races, the soldiers called him Silver Heels. J.B. Thayer arranged. Without Bread, told by John Marshall's sister. He was then an officer in the American Army, and he came home for a visit, accompanied by some of his brother officers, some young French gentlemen. When supper time arrived, mother had the meal prepared for them and had made into bread a little flour, the last she had, which had been saved for such an occasion. The little ones cried for some, and Brother John inquired into matters. He would eat no more of the bread, which could not be shared with us. He was greatly distressed at the straits to which the fortunes of war had reduced us, and Mother had not intended him to know our condition. From the Green Bag his mother, John Marshall's mother, Mary Isham Keith, was a woman of great force of character and strong religious faith. She was pleasing in mind, person, and manners, and her son loved her with that chivalrous, tender devotion which made him gentle with all women throughout his life. A few weeks before his death, John Marshall told his friend, Judge Story, that he had never failed to repeat each night through his long life the little prayer which begins, Now I lay me down to sleep, that he had learned when a baby at his mother's knee. Sally E. Marshall Hardy arranged. His Father his father, Thomas Marshall, served with great distinction during the War for Independence. He was a man of uncommon capacity and vigor of intellect. John Marshall, after he became Chief Justice, used often to speak of him in terms of the deepest affection and reverence. Indeed, he never named his father without dwelling on his character, with a fond and winning enthusiasm. My father, he would say, with kindled feelings and emphasis, 
My father was a far abler man than any of his sons. To him, I owe the solid foundation of all my own success in life. Justice Joseph Story Condensed Three Stories What Was in the Saddlebags? One autumn, John Marshall was invited to visit Mount Vernon in company with Washington's nephew. On their way to Mount Vernon, the two travelers met with a misadventure which gave great amusement to Washington and of which he enjoyed telling his friends. They came on horseback and carried but one pair of saddlebags, each using one side. Arriving thoroughly drenched by rain, they were shown to a chamber to change their garments. One opened his side of the bags and drew forth a black bottle of whiskey. He insisted that he had opened his companion's repository. Unlocking the other side, they found a big twist of tobacco, some cornbread, and the equipment of a pack saddle. They had exchanged saddlebags with some traveler and now had to appear in a ludicrous misfit of borrowed clothes. Eating Cherries After the war, John Marshall studied law and began practice in Virginia courts. He served in many important offices, both of his state and of the nation. Here is a little story told of him when he first began his practice. At that time, he was very simple, though neat, in his dress. He was one morning strolling, we are told, through the streets of Richmond, attired in a plain linen roundabout and shorts, with his hat under his arm, from which he was eating cherries. When he stopped in the porch of the Eagle Hotel, indulged in a little pleasantry with the landlord, and then passed on. A gentleman from the country was present who had a case coming on before the Court of Appeals and was referred by the landlord to Marshall as the best lawyer to employ. But the careless, languid air of Marshall had so prejudiced the man that he refused to employ him. The clerk, when this client entered the courtroom, also recommended Marshall, but the other would have none of him. A venerable-looking lawyer with powdered wig and in black cloth soon entered, and the gentleman engaged him. In the first case that came up, this man and Marshall spoke on opposite sides. The gentleman listened saw his mistake, and secured Marshall at once, frankly telling him the whole story and adding that while he had come with $100 to pay his lawyer, he had but $5 left. Marshall good-naturedly took this and helped in the case. Learned in the Law of Nations In time, John Marshall became a great lawyer. He declined the office of district attorney of the United States at Richmond, that of attorney general of the United States, and that of minister to France, all offered him by Washington. When President Adams persuaded him to go as envoy to France, he wrote to another envoy of General Marshall, as he was then called, from his rank of brigadier general in the Virginia militia. He is a plain man, very sensible, cautious, guarded, and learned in the law of nations. James B. Thayer arranged. The Constitution. As the British Constitution is the most subtle organism which has proceeded from progressive history, so the American Constitution is the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. William Ewart 
Gladstone. A constitution, says the dictionary, is the fundamental organic law or principles of government of a nation, state, society, or other organized body of men. Also, a written instrument embodying such law. This is not so hard to understand. The first statement may be applied to the English Constitution, which is not a written document like ours. It is, instead, a vast body of laws and judicial decisions which, accumulating through the centuries and beginning long before the time of the Magna Carta, have been handed down from one generation to another. On the other hand, the second statement in the dictionary may be applied to the Constitution of the United States, which is a document, a written instrument, framed and adopted for our protection by those able and noble patriots who met in the Federal Convention over which George Washington himself presided. They were wise men, learned in the law and far-sighted. They planned a government for the great future of a very great free people. Since its adoption, other republics of the world have used our Constitution as a model for their own. Our Constitution guarantees self-government and regulates just government. It is the foundation of our national life. Without it, we should be threatened with anarchy. Anarchy means universal confusion, terror, bloodshed, lawlessness of every description, and the destruction of religion, education, business, and of everything which makes life and home beautiful and safe. After we had declared our independence and won our liberty, this country was threatened with anarchy because we had as yet no constitution to regulate government and each state did much as it pleased. But after the constitution was adopted and the states were united and had become one people under one government, order, peace, and prosperity resulted. Thus, the amazingly rapid growth of our beloved country, as Washington called it, is due to the safeguards of that most precious document, the Constitution of the United States, for which reason every boy and girl should read it carefully, should regard it with reverence, and should surround it with every protection, as being with the blessing of God, the source of the life and welfare of our nation. As for John Marshall, he did not help to frame the Constitution, but it was largely through his efforts and those of James Madison that the Virginia State Legislature ratified it. In another way, also, he had a great part in its making. After the Constitution was adopted, being a new document, there existed no body of judicial decisions interpreting its meanings, like the decisions of England, which guided English judges. A body of American decisions had to be made to interpret our Constitution in order to guide American judges. This was John Marshall's great work. In 1801, President John Adams called the profound lawyer John Marshall to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. It was a most wise appointment, as we shall now see. Expounding the Constitution Chief Justice Marshall took his place at the head of the national judiciary. The government, under the Constitution, was only organized 12 years before, and in the interval, 11 amendments of the Constitution had been regularly proposed and adopted. Comparatively, nothing had been done judicially to define the powers or develop the resources of the Constitution. In short, 
the nation, the Constitution, and the laws were in their infancy. Under these circumstances, it was most fortunate for the country that the great Chief Justice retained his high position for 34 years, and that during all that time, with scarcely any interruption, he kept on with the work he showed himself so competent to perform. As year after year went by, and new occasion required, with his irresistible logic enforced by his cogent English, he developed the hidden treasures of the Constitution, demonstrated its capacities, and showed beyond all possibility of doubt that a government rightfully administered under its authority could protect itself against itself and against the world. Hardly a day now passes in the court he so dignified and adorned without reference to some decision of his time as establishing a principle which, from that day to this, has been accepted as undoubted law. In all the various questions of constitutional, international, and general law, the Chief Justice was at home, and when, at the end of his long and imminent career, he laid down his life, he and those who had so ably assisted him in his great work had the right to say that the judicial power of the United States had been carefully preserved and wisely administered. The nation can never honor him or them too much for the work they accomplished. Chief Justice Waite arranged. The Great Chief Justice I have always thought from my earliest youth till now that the greatest scourge an angry heaven ever inflicted upon an ungrateful and a sinning people was an ignorant, a corrupt, or a dependent judiciary. John Marshall Respected by all, when the venerable life of the Chief Justice was near its close, he was called to give his parting counsel to his native state in the revision of her constitution. A spectacle of greater dignity than the Convention of Virginia in the year 1829 has rarely been exhibited. At its head was James Monroe, conducted to the chair by James Madison and John Marshall, and surrounded by the strength of Virginia, including many of the greatest names of the Union. The reverence manifested for Chief Justice Marshall was one of the most beautiful features of the scene. The gentleness of his temper, the purity of his motives, the sincerity of his convictions, and his wisdom were confessed by all. He stood in the center of his native state, in his very home of fifty years, surrounded by men who had known him as long as they had known anything, and there was no one to rise up even to question his opinions without a tribute to his personal excellence. The True Man This admirable man, extraordinary in the powers of his mind, illustrious by his services, exalted by his public station, was one of the most warm-hearted, unassuming, and excellent of men. His life from youth to old age was one unbroken harmony of mind, affections, principles, and manners. His kinsman says of him, he had no phrase in boyhood. He had no quarrels or outbreakings in manhood. He was the composer of strifes. He spoke ill of no man. He meddled not with their affairs. He viewed their worst deeds through the medium of charity. Another of his intimate personal friends has said of him, in private life he was upright and scrupulously just in all his transactions. His friendships were ardent, sincere, and constant. His charity and benevolence unbounded. 
magnanimous and forgiving, he never bore malice. Religious from sentiment and reflection, he was a Christian, believed in the gospel, and practiced its tenets. Horace Binney, Condensed What of the Constitution? The unity of government which constitutes you, one people, is also now dear to you. It is justly so, for it is a main pillar in the edifice of your real independence, the support of your tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your prosperity, of that very liberty which you so highly prize. To the efficacy and permanency of your union, a government for the whole is indispensable. Washington, from his farewell address. To me, it is a marvel that the Constitution of the United States has operated so successfully. But the United States is a singular example of political virtue and moral rectitude. That nation has been cradled in liberty, has been nurtured in liberty, and has been maintained by pure liberty. I will add that the people of the United States are unique in the history of the human race. Simon Bolivar, The Liberator Let us make our generation one of the strongest and brightest links in that golden chain which is destined, I fondly believe, to grapple the people of all the states to this Constitution for ages to come. We have a great, popular, constitutional government, defended by the affections of the whole people. No monarchical throne presses these states together. No iron chain of military power encircles them. They live and stand under a government, popular in its form, representative in its character, founded upon principles of equality and so constructed, we hope, as to last forever. Its daily respiration is liberty and patriotism. Its yet youthful veins are full of enterprise, courage, and honorable love of glory and renown. Daniel Webster May our children and our children's children for a thousand generations continue to enjoy the benefits conferred upon us by a united country and have cause yet to rejoice under those glorious institutions bequeathed us by Washington and his compeers. Now, my friends, soldiers, and citizens, I can only say once more, farewell. Abraham Lincoln Envoy God of our fathers, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty all the starry band of shining worlds in splendor through the skies, our grateful songs before thy throne arise. Thy love divine hath led us in the past. In this free land, by thee our lot is cast. Be thou our ruler, guardian, guide and stay thy word our law thy paths our chosen way from war's alarms from deadly pestilence be thy strong arm our ever sure defense thy true religion in our hearts increase thy bounteous goodness nourish us in peace Refresh thy people on their toilsome way. Lead us from night to never-ending day. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine, and glory, laud, and praise be ever thine. D.C. Roberts, 1876 End of chapter 25 Recording by Bo Wood End of Good Stories for Great Birthdays by Francis Jenkins Alcott